guys, and welcome back for another episode of the Social Hour Podcast, a podcast for SOAS by SOAS. I'm your host, Ashley. And I'm your host, Bethany. And on today's episode, Ashley and I are talking about sewing safety mm-hmm. and proper machine care. Two Bethany's very, very passionate about Y'all this. ready for this? <laughs> Uh, you know, if you followed me for any length of time, you know how passionate I am about these things. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. But we're going to have fun with it. We are. It's yeah. all to help you guys. I think sometimes um, we, two ends of the spectrum here. One being you're a new sewist and you just don't know these things. So it's good mm-hmm. to be learning them as a new sewist to keep yourself safe the people around you safe in your sewing space and how to take care of your machine. So it lasts mm-hmm. a very long time. Um, the other end of that spectrum is people who've been sewing for a long time. Sometimes we get a little complacent with um, machine care or uh, we get a little too comfortable with things and accidents happen that could have been avoided. Mm-hmm. Um, we're going to share some of those stories today. <laughs> yeah. And um, a few, yeah, anecdotal evidence. Yeah. So <laughs> we're just going to take a minute to just talk about the importance of just keeping these top of mind. Um, mm-hmm. Taking a few minutes to do just a couple of these things is to your benefit. Um, maybe not all of these things will apply to you in your sewing space or your, the type of sewing you do or whatever, but a lot of it probably will. Mm -hmm. So we're going to start off with safety first, always. Yep. (laughs) And then we're going to switch over to machine care because I get questions all the time about machine care, um, best practices and those kind of things. And honestly, a lot of people's troubleshooting issues with their machines stem from not properly caring for their machines. So if you have ever asked me a question about machine care or been curious about it, be sure you stay tuned to the, we're going to wrap up with that topic because it's so important. Mm-hmm. All right. Machine safety. Let's start with machine safety. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's important for a sewist to fully understand all the features on their machine and how it operates, not in detail. I don't need you to take it apart and be a service expert, okay? But I I need you to be understanding of what all these different levers and things do Mm -hmm. so that when something goes wrong, you can one recognize that something's wrong because you hear something right or you see something isn't stitching properly Mm -hmm. but you can kind of isolate the source or the issue and start troubleshooting because you can't solve the problem if you don't understand the machine Mm -hmm. and this goes for anybody at any sewing level because we get new machines all the time and you know you just know i mean my singer machines a sewing machine operates in the same way, but my Singer machines are, are going to operate differently than my FOF, right? Like they're, they're just different end, ends of the spectrum of types of machines. So, you know, and mechanical machines operate different than computerized machines. Mm-hmm. I had someone message me just yesterday, actually, who has mechanical heavy duty. And she's like, sometimes it sounds like kind of clunky and she's used to having a computerized machine and she chose to go with a mechanical uh, for the heavy duty because she needed that. And I, and I said, it's going to sound different than a computerized machine. Mm. And she's like, I just thought something was wrong with it. I was like, no, it's nothing wrong. It's, it's a different mechanism that's operating this machine for it's all mechanical. It's just different. Um, and so it's going to sound a little clunkier, a mechanical machine than a computerized. Yeah. So, there was just things like that. You just have to become more self-aware of your machine. And I think it kind of starts with reading the manual. Oh, that the, thing. That thing. Okay. So you don't have to read the whole thing. I'll confess that I haven't, but the part that tells you about machine, like all the, all the things on your machine. And um, there's a whole section typically about like troubleshooting issues. Mm-hmm, did you mm-hmm. know that oh my I gosh did, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah you know you don't need to know how to set all the stitches and all of that you, you, you can skip through that you can reference that later if you want but the the features of the machine the what those buttons do how to thread your machine how to load the bobbin 
um, and then machine care and safety. And then there's also typically a list of like recommended needle sizes and recommended mm -hmm. feet and, and those kind of things. So always start there. Oh well, yeah. If you don't use the recommended things, then yeah. you can also cause problems. But I did want to touch on the fact that like, we have newer machines now and mine even has fail safes in it where mm -hmm. if it, you know, hits a brick wall, then it just stops, you know? Yeah. But the older machines I found were kind of terrifying. <laughs> yeah. um, I remember on my mom's old Kenmore, you know, like, yep. I'm not going to lie. I feel like when I use that, if I, if you didn't already have glasses, maybe having a pair of safety glasses, even if you're like, you know, if you're teaching your children or something like that, because yeah. that's when I broke the most of my needles was when I just would be like, I'm getting through this fabric and I don't even care. And then I would go breaking off a needle off into my face or something like that. Yeah. So that's not, uh, that's not, I mean, it sounds crazy, but you know, it happens. It does. That's why we're talking about it. Yeah. You know, the, I find that, um, the computerized machines have more of those fail safes in place than like the mm -hmm. mechanical machines do yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. And obviously older machines don't really have those features like they do now. And so, you know, like my FOF has a whole screen on the side. It pops up, your bobbin's running low. Like that's not normal for most sewing machines. Mm -hmm. So it's it's the oddball out. But um, for my other machines, man, it you can, I mean, I've broken some needles. Yeah. But I've also hurt myself. Right when it goes off. right down into the machine, yep. if the bobbin casing gets, especially when the bobbin gets low, and if it's like kind of tangled at the beginning, like it can kind of screw up that mechanism. So really, just to keep in mind that, make yep. sure your bobbin, you know, when it gets low, it's just like you know what? Instead of waiting until it's all gone, <laughs> just you know, just take it out. Change it as soon as just you notice it. it. Yeah, yeah feel uh, it. The it. the people that put in a bobbin that has like four wraps of thread around it i'm like but why <laughs> but yeah why? <laughs> um the other thing i think hole. is important to mention is when you are not using your machine unplug it Ugh. or turn it off at least yeah. turn it off um mm -hmm. but unplug it um or if it's plugged into a power strip which is what i some sort of surge protector i highly recommend especially if your machine is a computerized machine, I highly recommend having it plugged into a surge protector because mm -hmm. even if it's turned off, if it's plugged into the wall and let's say lightning strikes, that, that, that sucker could get fried. So all of my machines plug into surge protectors, mechanical, computerized, doesn't matter. That's just my rule of thumb. Mm -hmm. And I don't plug more than like my machine and one other thing into that surge protector. Mm -hmm. Unless it's like one of my big, big beastie ones but i really limit and i don't plug an iron into mm. a surge protector that's got a machine plugged into it and iron gets its own plug okay that you don't realize how much those draw um and so that can cause impacts ashley's looking suspicious over here <laughs> but i'm just speaking from someone yeah. who um are you tripping has, breakers i have yeah. I also live in a house that's over 50 years old that's and exactly. the wiring is a super sketch. Yeah. yeah. Uh, definitely a DIY job by the previous owner and several, several of these things. And so oh we have fail safes and yeah, yeah. between my sewing room, my studio and Brett's lasers and 3D printers oh, yeah. and whatnot, we have like extra breakers to support. We have multiple just rooms on one breaker. See, that's yes. a problem. So we actually like set, we actually fixed that. Yeah. But yeah. but it's some houses it's, are it's like just that. an older house. So you just need to know. But uh, let's just be honest, some of these new builds aren't any better. So yeah, yeah, you sure. you just need to protect yourself. Um, mm -hmm. you know, this is kind of off topic, but you remember back when Xboxes or Playstations used to just catch fire because they would just be running and they would overheat? Like I saw a person's house burn down because of that. And my neighbor catty corner for me. They were oh, on vacation. That was an Xbox? It, I don't know if it was it was some sort of gaming device. I don't want to say Whoa. which one because I can't I don't remember. But it was just plugged in and not being used. It was plugged in, but it wasn't on, but the fan was well, it was on, but the it was on it was asleep, you know? Right, and so right, it's right. not like on the TV, but it was still the fan was still running. It overheated hmm. and caught fire and burnt their house down. Um 
not to scare you guys. No, but I'm just saying, like, even and that was a newer house. So it's like, you just never know. And Mm -hmm. this is why we like surge protectors. This is why we like to unplug things. So what I do, I don't unplug my cords because I'm not crawling down there on the floor every time. I'll turn off my machine. And if and then I definitely will go through and flip the power to my surge protectors, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, especially if storms are coming through. Or if mm-hmm. I'm going out of town, everything gets turned off. Yeah. Surge protectors, everything's off. I go all the way. But mm-hmm. that's it's just because I've invested so much into these machines that and and my space and my home, I don't want anything to happen. I'm not mm-hmm. trying to scare you guys, but like these are things you just need to be aware of. Some people oh. are very haphazard about just plugging things in. Oh, it turns on, it's fine. <laughs> you know, my my machine, um, if the presser foot is up, if you press the foot pedal, nothing happens. But the older machines, like if my child was under the table or my dog was under the table or yeah. something, right? And then they go to lay down, like Blue's laid down the foot pedal before, um, and it just takes off on you kind of thing. Mm-hmm. That stuff scares me. So let's <laughs> talk about that safety with kids and, and yeah. pets and other people in your homes. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we have, these are machines with sharp needles. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, kids are intrigued. Some of us even have industrial machines that yeah. have these really cool on off buttons on the front of them. And they, uh, they make these cool noises and you, they, they have, have big, that belt. They have these big pedals on the bottom. And, you know, there's just so many things that can be dangerous. The flip side of that is, um, we were talking about this yesterday, Ashley, is if you have pets that come into Mm -hmm. your sewing space, if your pet is one that eats things, like puts things in their mouth, um, I couldn't tell you how many times I've dropped pins, clips, thread, fabric scraps, God knows, chalk, who knows, all sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on my floor not knowing it was there and my dogs are coming through now my dogs don't put things in their mouths thankfully that they shouldn't they they just aren't those kind of dogs i've had dogs like that before i've had dogs that would eat everything um and so you just need to be aware if your dog is one of those dogs or your cat is or any pet is like that it's probably best that they not come into your sewing space. Yeah. I'm all for having your pet in your space if they make you happy and bring you joy and they're safe. But mm-hmm. if they can't be trusted and accidents do happen where we drop things, the last thing you want is for that dog to, to swallow a, a needle or step on a needle. See, what I do with my needles is that I will be like, okay, I'm using 10 needles. Mm-hmm. And then when I put them away, I make sure that I put 10 away. Because I've had For them pins. all. You mean pins? Uh, I, you I, mean, I, yeah, yeah. You mean pins. pins? Okay, I call them needles too, but y'all know what we mean. The pins, like you pin your fabric. Sorry. Yeah. I'll, typically, I use clips just so that I, I can too. avoid that altogether. But when I have to, I count how many pins yeah. I use so nope. that I can I can make sure that uh, I don't sit them on my table. They either are going straight out of my pin cushion into my fabric or straight out of my fabric back into my pin cushion. Right. Yeah. They never just get laid on a table because that's how they get brushed off onto the floor. So either mm-hmm. I'm stepping on them barefoot, my dog's going to get a pin in their paw, or if yeah. they were to lick or cat, eat. Mm-hmm. They have the barbs in their tongue. Mm-hmm. And if they start to even just take a pin in their mouth, the tongue will push it back into their throat and they have no choice mm-hmm. but to swallow it. It's, terrifying but oh, oh here's another thing with the with the pins if you uh if you have a needle with a thread hanging off of it i usually would typically do that i talked to the vet and the vet said that that's when things get really complicated if your dog or cat were, were to take in a needle they probably would pass it but if there's a string on it that's when things can get really really bad so if there's really a string bad. through the eye of the needle and they swallow that that's more dangerous than just so- swallowing the needle itself yeah yeah because they can get tangled and caught yeah. more. That's crazy. Like, so, I mean, there's a, there's a chance that they could just pass that needle mm-hmm. absolutely fine. But mm-hmm. yeah, we're not trying to scare you guys by any means. I know it probably sounds like it, but it's just things that you probably haven't thought about or haven't thought about in a while. And it, and the next time you go into your sewing space, I just want you to look around and go, Hmm, mm-hmm. 
what stuck out to me there in this conversation. Think about that as we continue talking through these, because it's all about safety for not just you, but your pets, your children, the people that come into Brand your kids. space. Yeah. Any, anybody that comes into your space and, but in yourself. Okay. Yeah. Your loved ones. So um, let's move on to like scissors and cutting tool safety. I feel like, Hmm. Oh gosh, I don't have a rotor. The reason I'm asking her to grab this is because we're going to show this in the video. Well, this is important. Um, rotary cutters. If you hold a rotary cutter like Ashley is right now with your fist, like you're going to stab <laughs> somebody with it, okay? And you're using it like that and you're having to put that much force in it, that's not safe. The proper way to hold it is like that. And where you, you're almost like holding it like a pen and your, your, your hand is at an angle. You're not doing it straight up and down. It's at an angle. You're going to have more yeah. control. You have more control over the pressure. You shouldn't have to push that hard. If you're having to push that hard with your rotary cutter, it's time for a new blade. Yes. Um, That's why people, I think they're doing it like this is because they're trying to get a little bit of life left in that blade. And it's like, Girl, give it up. I just, I just don't think people realize how fast they go dull. And actually, no. um, and this is something that Brett tells me all the time. And he's like, you know, military. So he like knows all about like knives and, and, mm. and stuff like that and safety. He's like a dull knife is actually more dangerous yes. than a sharp one. Yeah. Um, so a dull blade on your rotary cutter is more dangerous than a sharp mm -hmm. brand new one. So just, I mean, both can cut you, but if you're really having to like force it to cut, you're more likely to push too hard, lose control and run over your knuckle or finger or something. Um, and I've done that. I've gotten, mm -hmm. or you get, you know, distracted or you're going too fast. I've mm -hmm. had a rotary cutter. This happened at the office one day. I was um, using a rotary cutter that I don't usually use because it was from the office and I'm in the cutting room and I'm cutting some fabric real quick and it skipped up over the ruler and mm -hmm. went across my knuckle, my thumb, mm -hmm. and it just started. And I was like, ah. Oh. Look at That's that. when you go get those little handles, the the uh, shower handles, that suction cup to the wall. Yes. Put that on your big rulers. I need to do that. Add to cart, Amazon. I haven't. No, I need to. Yeah, no. You know, we talked about that in one of our first episodes yeah, of the podcast. get those at the thrift store, too, because people only buy them for, like, wheelchair accessibility mm -hmm. or someone you know it was a fall risk or something like that and they 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 had it and then they got rid of it because that person maybe passed on or whatever these companies are selling them mm -hmm. as if there's some sewing thing like oh look this is from 40 dollars when you can buy it for like three dollars at like, value like the dollar bill. store <laughs> Oh, it drives me nuts because it's like they just took something that was for yeah. something else and then remarketed and then charged so us. way more. Yeah. It's not nice. I no, like it's just suction cups. So you can actually take it off and put it one on different rulers and mm. rotate it between your different size rulers. But it is nice because it will keep your hand up out of that way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but but please, every time I see someone using a rotary cutter um, like a Savage, it it makes me cringe because it's setting an example for others who don't know any better to start doing it that way. And I'm like, no, and mm -hmm. people are going to get hurt. So people don't take the time to like read instructions on those kind of things of like how to properly use them. So we're just going to take a moment to talk about it now. <laughs> we care about your fingers, you know, you, you we oh, need yeah. them to be able to sew. We had Whitney um, on the podcast and yes. she like, she literally took a trip to the ER. Yeah. She like mm -hmm. cut the end of her finger off. It, they're very, they're very dangerous. Oh, so the other thing is that the the glove you can oh, yes. buy. Uh, what is it called? Um, I will have to pull the link for it, and like we can post a picture. Or something. It looks like uh, you know those hot like um. When I used to work in a restaurant, we had them. Mm -hmm. Um, they would their gloves. They're thick, um, mm -hmm. but they um would protect you from getting burned. But they were like yeah. a glove. That wasn't like an oven mitt. It was actually like five finger glove. It, was it, like looks, it looks kind of like that, but it prevents you from being able to cut through the material and hurt your hand. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of like a glove that you can't cut 
like the rotary couldn't cut through it. Like mm -hmm. you might get a little bruise on your finger if you do it hard enough and you run into your hand hard enough, but you're not going to slice your finger off. And mm -hmm. so if you're one of those people who struggles with um, rotary cutters or you're nervous to use them, because some people are, um, get get the glove, get the, the or the suction cup handle, um, put the glove on the hand opposite of the one that's using the rotary cutter because mm -hmm. that's the one that's going to be holding your ruler or your fabric or your pattern down. And you want to, you know, be yeah. safe. Um, mm -hmm. So those are some resources that could be helpful to, you know, the more you use it, the more comfortable you're going to be with it. But at the same time, sometimes being too comfortable with it is where those accidents can happen too. Sure. Um, I also recommend um, with scissors that you, if you're not going to sharpen your scissors, your fabric scissors or your snips from time to time that you get new ones every so often, they mm -hmm. too go dull and they can also be very dangerous. Um, if you're not actually, um, I went out and got, um, uh, like a mechanical, like big stone spinning. Yes. <laughs> scissor. Or it's like a, a blade. I don't know. Whatever. You can sharpen anything. But I got it from an auction. And it's for like, you know, the garage or whatever. But I do all my own scissors because, you know, they're so expensive that it's actually cheaper to just go and buy a, you know, a big yep. <laughs> sharpener. I've had Brett sharpen mine before. Um, but I will say um, sometimes the sewing expos that you might go to, look mm. at the vendor list because if there's a scissor vendor there typically mm -hmm. they will offer to sharpen your scissors during the event for a few bucks right. um and that's they don't always they'll they'll sharpen like any brand right yeah. like they don't care that it's a service that they offer and so if you are going to one of these sewing expos check the vendor list i've been to several and i'm like oh, I wish I had known they were here. I could have brought my scissors with me and they could have sharpened them. They'll even sharpen your pinking shears. Yes. Yes. And that's those are possible to sharpen on your own. So um, I just a little tidbit. Yeah. Next time you go to, a, a you know, sewing expo, just, just look and ask if anybody is going to be offering that service. Cause that's a t good place that they typically do that. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about fabric handling. We're going to switch gears a little bit. Um, I think the thing for me with fabric is, and this is just common sense, but not everybody does it, is if it's a fabric that you're going to wear, mm. wash, it, wash it first. Mm -hmm. If it's a fabric you got from a yard sale, a state sale, a wash thrift store, wash it. <laughs> um, I would never wash not wash it. Wash it. Um, <laughs> if it's from like if it's a cot like a quilting cotton some people don't want to wash their quilting cotton until before they quilt yeah. it and that's okay but just know where it came from and just if it's been sitting in a warehouse you might want to wash it first definitely um, wash it before you gift it i would say right or and wear it in those kind of and it's not just about shrinkage that we're referencing here like the issue with things like shrinking um, or fading. It's more um, also about the way that those fabrics are stored and the facilities oh, yeah. that they're made in. Um, I'll give you an example. One time I bought a shirt from a big store at the mall. I won't say what. This is before I was sewing my own clothes again. Okay. So don't judge me. Um, <laughs> and I was working at a corporate job. So I needed a blouse. I wore lightweight blouses all the time under my blazer i had to wear suits to work and um so i had this blouse that i bought it's so cute and i'm sitting at the office it was brand new and i didn't wash it yet i literally just took the tags off of it and threw it on again don't judge me for doing that we all have done that um so this is a judge-free zone We've all done that where it's like, oh gosh, I don't have anything clean to wear or I don't want to iron. I don't have time to iron. This is brand new. It doesn't need to be ironed. Rip the tags off, throw it on, go to the office. Yeah. I'm sitting in the office at my desk and I start breaking out in oh, like a rash and I'm itching and I can't stop scratching. And I'm just like, oh, I had to leave work, go all the way home, take it off, immediately put it in the wash and had to shower to get whatever it was off of me 
change clothes again and go back to the office. Like it, you just never, and this is from a very well-known store. So it wasn't so like you a just, fiber content. It was definitely mm -mm. possibly and I, they spray the fabrics be, for, uh -huh. for bugs, especially during transit, right? Well, and you just don't know where they're being stored. I have allergies to like certain molds, dust mites, mm -hmm. um, certain things like that. Maybe that all do. <laughs> but like mine are elevated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've had allergy testing, so mine are elevated. I have a lot of environmental allergies. So if it had been exposed to anything like that, where it just, you know, got a ton of pollen or stuff on it, like I was rashed out like had to take benadryl um, um so and just from a shirt and i have bought so many shirts from this place just like it in different colors and never had that reaction so mm -hmm. you know you just have to live and learn live and yep. learn um the other thing i want to mention is since you mentioned um it kind of a little bit um when you wash things if this is something that you're gifting to someone um keep in mind with what you're washing it with so mm -hmm. Um, if it's a quilt or baby clothes or a baby blanket or anything for a baby, I would wash it with something that's like dye free, free and clear. Um, I know all makes like a baby safe, free and clear detergent. Mm -hmm. um, if it's something you're going to be gifting to anybody, that would be kind of my rule of thumb. And I say that as someone who's allergic to Tide. Uh -huh. I can't, if, if I go somewhere and I stay somewhere and they have washed their towels or bed sheets with Tide, I can't you know. use them. <sighs> That's horrible. So it's just, again, things that people don't think about if it doesn't affect them. But if mm -hmm. you're gifting things, better safe than sorry. Because you don't want to gift yep. a, someone a, a dress and then they break out from it because you washed it in Tide and they're allergic to it or whatever, you know, yeah. or they it's got a dye in it that they can't have on their skin. So there's allergies, there's allergens, um, just something worth mentioning. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about iron safety because um, I'm super guilty of this. You know, I was talking earlier about like mm -hmm. plugging things in and unplugging things. I do that so well with my machine. All of my sewing machines, I do that very well. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to my iron, it has this lovely automatic to shut off. It's got this auto shut off. So I'm just like, it's not on, but it's still plugged in. It's still drawing power. And if someone were to come by and touch it, it would come back on and then heat up again when it doesn't yeah. need to. Yeah. I'm trying to do better. I don't always unplug it, but I'm trying to do better. I try to at least unplug it before I go to bed. I don't always Maybe. unplug it before I leave my house to go run an errand. <laughs> I know. But don't worry, going to burn your house down. Well, I hope not, but it's, it's not a good thing. It's not a good habit. I'm saying it because I know I'm not the only one. Yeah. And, um, and if me saying it and owning up to my horrible habit convinces someone else to stop it as well, we'll, we'll do this together. You guys are going to hold me accountable. Mm -hmm. Ashley's going to be like, did you unplug your iron today? <laughs> Every day, every morning, every day. Did you unplug no, before I go to bed, please <laughs> ask me before I go to bed. Okay. Um, but seriously, it's a, <laughs> it's, it's best to um, unplug it. And if you are using it a lot, just be aware that, like my dogs like to lay under my ironing board. So if they were to bump it, it could fall off. Or yeah. if it were a, a kid coming running through, you know, make sure that your iron's in a place that's oh. not in a high traffic area. My kids, uh, like they come in the room and they just start touching things. And I'll have to like, if I'm sitting there and I have my iron heated and I'm doing something, Bianca always just wants to put her hands. I'm like, that's hot. Like one of these days, she's just gonna just touch the plate <laughs> She I won't do to... it again if she does. Oh my god! Because she but just yeah. like it's so pretty and nice that she just wants to touch it, and I'm like, "Don't mm -hmm. pet my iron, please." <laughs> <laughs> It'll burn you. It already burned me today with its hot steam. Yeah. yeah. Um. So just just be aware of that. Um. We kind of talked about safety glasses and eye protection. I I feel like this applies with certain certain situations and and projects. And I think this really applies to if you're sewing something 
super heavy duty, you're yeah. more likely to break a needle. Especially with like your industrials and stuff. Industrial machines, especially um, when I worked at the drapery shop, there was that tack machine. I've talked about it before. Oh, that, yeah. That thing gave me nightmares. You have and to I, wear. I, I, well, I didn't have, they didn't have a welding any. mask if I was using that thing. <laughs> That's what you needed with that machine. Yeah. <laughs> this one had no, they didn't provide any protection. I just had my big old glasses on. Oh. Thank goodness I wear big glasses. Um, but. It cool. broke the needle and it still hit me right here under my glasses, under my left eye. It like flew up under and it got, but my glasses yeah. kind of stopped it a little bit. Um, and it broke, that needle broke into three pieces. Oh, so it was That's terrifying. Thick Very thick needles, Ooh. those machines. So, so fast the needles break often because they get so hot. They right. become brittle. So, um, after that, this is back during the pandemic when people had those like glasses, like the face shield that you could wear like mm -hmm. glasses. So I got one of those and it was like a plastic face shield with the glasses that I could go over my own glasses. Mm -hmm. And that was the only way I was going to use that machine again. <laughs> the only way. And even then I was like, oh, <laughs> so scared to use it. It was terrifying, but I've had needles break on my heavy duty machine when I was sewing um, one of those placemats, plastic mm. placemats into a clutch. Yeah. And I'm going through that plastic woven wicker plastic and zipper and mm -hmm. lining. And I mean, the machine could sew it. I hit something I shouldn't have yeah. on the zipper. Yeah. And it broke the needle and it went flying. So well, it's even just those, uh, the nylon zippers, like, Mm -hmm. Even if you're not hitting like a zipper stop or whatever, you can kind of hit the the teeth in just a just the right way mm -hmm. for it to stop your machine or break a needle. So correct. When I go over things like that, I use my hand wheel and take those stitches nice and slow. I don't use my foot pedal for that. I'm like, if we're going over zipper teeth, I'm using my hand wheel and cranking it one stitch at a time safely over the zipper teeth. Um, so that I don't break a needle and I don't damage my project. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it just things like that. Now, speaking of needles, we were talking about this earlier, uh, about pins and, and those kind of things. But did you, did you know, fun fact, did you know that you're supposed to change your needle <laughs> every six to eight hours of sewing? And some people say eight to 10 hours. So let's just call it down the middle. Every eight hours of sewing Okay, not eight mm -hmm. hours of being in your sewing room, eight hours of actually sitting at your machine sewing and stitching. You should change. But how do you keep track of that? You know, I, I'm probably not the best rule on this because I sew so much for work. Yeah. Um, but like once a know, month. No, I change well, my needles way more often than that. Once every two weeks. I change my needles more often than that. Oh my God. Well, I can't afford it. It's expensive. Maybe, but <laughs> it's the key tool to the, to your machine and the success. Let me talk about needles for a second. Needles, they all kind of look the same, but they're all a little different. And all what, what, but what happens is Ashley's going to be devil's advocate over here and irritate me. Um, what <laughs> happens is the, they wear down. You can't really see it visibly to the eye. But they do wear down. Mm -hmm. They don't. They lose their sharpness. They'll they'll build up like funk or gunk or even like a burr. Yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. sometimes, and until you lay that needle that has been way overused next to a brand new needle, you don't really notice the difference. It um, gets so, taller too, right? So if you're having it does. So if you're having issues with your stitching, skipping, anything like that, you're either using the wrong needle for the project or the needle needs to be changed out. And mm -hmm. so if you're not sure, take a new one out and take your existing one out of the machine and <laughs> lay them on the table next to each other and go, yeah, there's a visible difference. I think it is time to switch it out. So if you're not really sure, that's a good judgment of like, if you're not sure how long you've been using it, there's, but if you're sewing heavy duty material on a, on a regular basis, it should be changed out. I know some people change out almost every project, but because if it's heavy duty needles, then you don't need to. No, wrong. 
quit spitting wrong information. <laughs> we're here to provide correct information, not we're now we're exposing <laughs> Ashley's bad habits. Okay. It's not just me with my iron. Universal for everything. No. It's like a no. universal remote. Works with every TV. <sighs> but does it? No. <laughs> no. Okay. Sorry. I'm I'm just I'm just saying I've had a lot of conversations with people lately in my DMs about troubleshooting issues with their machines and nine times out of ten, mm -hmm. it's time for a new needle. Yeah, it is. I we'll know. go I'm, through I need to be better at it. It's 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 not like I'm trying to be like the dictator of needles over here. <laughs> okay, but I want you to be set up for success. That's why we're talking about all of this. She I really want does. you to be set up for success. I mm -hmm. want to enjoy your sewing experience yeah. every time you sit down in front of your sewing machine. Mm -hmm. I am so passionate about that. I'm getting emotional about it because I really, really want you to understand if you hear nothing that I say today, changing your needles is like changing the thread for every project because the color matches, right? Like mm -hmm. you just, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. part of your tool. That's a good way to you should put on a shirt. I should. You know, I had on my shirt from Kasaya the other day, the Needle Ninja shirt. And every time I wear it, I'm like, I need to change my needle. Maybe oh. you put a post-it Maybe you put a post -it on the front of your machine. Yeah, yeah. And you write down what needle is in your machine. Mm -hmm. And then... Every time you sit down to sew, he's like, okay, well, I ballpark have sewn for, out of the whole project, you probably sewed for 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And you just kind of try to keep a rough estimate. It's not an exact thing, mm -hmm. but if you start keeping a rough estimate, it's like, oh, mm -hmm. okay. Well, I'm starting to see a difference in how it stitches. Yeah. You know? But some people think a universal needle means it will work with all materials and projects. And that's a false statement. I hate that they're called universal needles. Um, <laughs> and so I, I really do. I think it's false advertising. I don't, I, because people will go, well, it's universal. I can use it for whatever. But then when I tell them, Hey, that, that French Terry you're trying to sew and you're getting, having issues, try a ballpoint needle. Yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm game changer bethany is so passionate about this <laughs> like he gave everybody like every single needle under the sun when we went to the retreat i gave them quilting needles they don't even quilt i'm like you may I need them one day sometimes, sometimes you just never but, know but when you go to quilt you know you have quilting needles when you no. go to sew denim you know you have denim needles you go to mm -hmm. sew leather you have leather needles you know like it's it's part of the investment and it's also protecting your machine and the safety mm -hmm. of your machine, the safety of how it's used, the safety of, of how it stitches. It protects the machine. It's, it needs the right tools. You wouldn't put wooden wheels on your car. It's not going to be a good ride. You want to put good tires on your car. So let's just like set ourselves up for success here. People. You would, you'd put square <laughs> wheels on your car. Just to irritate me. <laughs> I'm dead serious. I'll get off my high horse, my my pedestal here, but yeah. seriously, um, this is it's it's just for your safety. It's mm -hmm. for your success. People get frustrated when their machines mess up, and my first question is, when did you change your needle last? <laughs> so if you don't want that question asked to you, don't send me a DM. If you need that question asked you, send me a DM. Okay, so what are the top like three things that you would do if like, let's say your your bobbin and thread is all gumming up. What is the first three things that you're like, check this, 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 um, Great before question. you send me a DM? <laughs> Great question. Okay, if you're having issues, this is the rule. If yeah. you're having issues with what the underside of your stitches look like, the underside of your fabric, Mm -hmm. Okay. It's getting knotted or whatever. It's a top thread problem. Really? If you're having issues with how the stitches look on the top of the fabric that you can see as you're sewing, mm -hmm. it's a bobbin issue. So it's like opposites. It's opposite. Interesting. It's opposite. But my rule of thumb is anytime I'm having any stitching issues, whether it's top thread or bobbin thread, I take everything out. Yeah. Everything out. 
I wiggle my needle to make sure it hasn't come loose. It's pushed up all the way in there. It's, you know, it's, it's in its right place. Mm -hmm. And then I rethread. Okay. And that usually solves it. Sometimes bobbin thread, bobbin thread will sometimes fall out of its tension uh, or wasn't properly threaded into the tension in that bobbin, you know, casing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the top thread, your issue is, you know, um, on, where's one? You know, on spools of thread that they mm -hmm. have that little Oh, nick. yeah. Yeah. But depending on which way your thread is on your spool holder, on your machine, that thread can continue to get caught in that nick. You can take a nail file and file that to make it smoother. Or, or you can around. turn the yeah. thread around if you need to. Um, but sometimes they have them on both ends, and that's annoying. Um, but your thread getting caught while you're sewing up here that you're not always looking, you're not looking at the top of your machine, mm -hmm. you're looking down. So you may not realize that the thread is getting caught. And that's why you're also having issues because it's throwing off your tension because it's pulling harder. Mm -hmm. It's getting mm -hmm. stuck. So if you're having skip stitches or jamming or anything like that, check your spools. Take I take a nail file and just file that off if you need to or smooth it out. That mm -hmm. slit will still be there for you to tuck in your thread when you're not using that spool but just smoothing that edge that can be rough can make a difference as well so i always unthread rethread and make sure that my spool is is on correctly and it's not jamming because that happens um so that's kind of my first rule of thumb i check my needle yeah. um and then i also will ask myself am i using the right needle for this fabric the right foot for this fabric. Maybe you should be using a different foot. Um, am I using the right stitch length for this fabric? So if you're sewing something super bulky, um, you may want to lengthen that stitch um, so that it can sew and move the fabric through better. Um, so there's just things like that. Like you can't just hit straight stitch and think that that's going to work for that. That default setting is going to work for everything that you the need. Universal to stitch. Good Lord. <laughs> You're going to give me stress and anxiety already. <laughs> Anyways, I hope those little tips help. But if you don't remember, like, the again, if it's a bottom thread issue on your fabric, it's a top thread problem. If it's a top thread issue, it's a bobbin problem. It's opposite. But when in doubt, pull it all out and rethread. Mm -hmm. And then and message Bethany. And then if it's still not working and you've checked all these other things and you've changed your needle, yeah, then message me. Then we'll talk. <laughs> then we'll talk. <laughs> all right. Uh, let's briefly kind of talk about chemical safety and storage. Now you're probably wondering, how does this apply to I my sewing space? Mm -hmm. um, what do you got in your sewing room? <laughs> I got all sorts of stuff in my sewing room. First of all, I have fabric dyes. Oh, yeah. So mm -hmm. you definitely want to keep those out of reach of children and pets. Um, I have adhesives. Um, mm, I have spray. spray yeah. I even have spray adhesives. Like for my quilting, when I do yeah. my quilt sandwich, mm -hmm. uh, you'll use a spray adhesive. That stuff can be very toxic. Um, so you want to make sure you're in a well-ventilated space. If you have any sort of sensitivity or allergen or asthma um, issues, uh you do not want to use those without using some sort of protection. Either take it outside or well-ventilated space or use a respiratory mask. Uh, um, I used to use those when I did more epoxy work. But if you, like, I get I get headaches from using it for just two seconds. So I'll throw my mask on just to spray it. And mm -hmm. then I'll leave my mask on till the air kind of clears out. I'll open the door and or turn the fan on just to kind of get it out. And then I could take my mask out. It just helps me pre prevent from getting a headache or inhaling any of it. It's an airborne adhesive. Yeah. You know, um, solvents as well. So, um, you know, like I've got stuff that will clean my irons. I've got stuff that mm -hmm. I can you know, like, like paste and rubs and stuff that I can use, but you just need to make sure you're using them safely, using them with a glove protect your skin because your skin's absorbent. Um, so just those kind of things. It's just worth mentioning. I keep all of that in a safe container and it's and all my glues. All of that is in a safe container altogether. Like it's not here and there and laying out. So mm -hmm. 
Um, so that's kind of really what I wanted to mention on that. Just making sure they're properly stored. Um, and oh if, it's an, air, if oh. it's an aerosol can, make sure it's stored in a room temperature space. Don't put it in a box in your attic. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. In the dead of summer. And then I think the last thing that's important um, is just to be first aid prepared. So you need to have a first aid kit within reach, like within your sewing space. Or in the hallway down, you know, I have a first aid kit in the hallway closet. Mm -hmm. But then I also keep bandages and stuff in my sewing room as well. No, um, sewing machine is important. Bite. They do. They do. I, I had we, mine bite me not that long ago. Me too. <laughs> and I got um, a quarter of the needle stuck in my finger. Mm. to the point where I had to pull it out in three separate pulls and it hurt so bad. And I'm over here like cheering her on like you could do it. Not pull it literally. Out. Yeah, like I'm just like She's I'm, in tears and I'm like it's okay. I don't know what to you do. Need to come out. Yeah. 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 I um I we have friends that we've we know that have had to go to the ER because mm -hmm. they've stitched through their finger. Um, that I did uh, at the sewing retreat <sighs> for the first time ever in my entire life. Uh, on your fof. So my finger. On my fof, a computerized machine with fail safes. But let me tell yeah. you, not my fof's machine's fault, not anybody's fault but my own. Let me tell mm -hmm. you what happened. I'm in a room with my sewing besties. <laughs> we are talking and sewing and having the best time. And I encourage you to do that. But. but when you're sewing, your attention needs to be on the sewing. Mm -hmm. Not on Diana standing there showing me how she's going to do this. So I look up to see what she's describing with her hands while my hands are right there under the needle. And you yeah. know what, what, it, what it was? Is my foot was up off the foot pedal but not away from the foot pedal. I just lifted my foot. So when I relaxed my foot, I hit the foot control while I'm looking at Diana, not realizing I had relaxed my foot and it had touched the foot control on the floor and I sewed my finger. Um, so that was not fun. So I figured out why my machine did it because I have the fail safes just like yours. But what happened was is that I have the, um, the scissor button Yep. And when you do that, it sends the needle down one more time. And I don't think the fail safe is in that mechanism mm -mm. because that's when I, I usually give it a that different button. command. Yeah, I press the button and then I pull out my fabric right away. As I'm pulling it out, I just did it a little too early as the needle was going in, and that's when it happened. <sighs> And then my yep. first reaction was I felt it and then I yanked my hand right away. And that's when things got way worse. That's what I did. But I have dip nail polish. So it actually mm -hmm. hit my dip nail polish. Yeah. And then I ripped. So it didn't go through my nail, but it slid down to the side of my nail and went through the side of my finger. And when I yeah. pulled, it ripped and tore the skin. So, I mean, it could have been worse had I not had dip polish. Yeah. <laughs> Mine, but, was, mine was worse because yeah. my, my finger was actually like upside down. You got the underside of it. Yeah. So I was like pulling the tender this bits. Ball. Yes. <laughs> the tender bits. We're not trying to gross you out or freak you out, guys. But it was because we were not, we were either getting rushed or distracted. I was on a live. She was on a live. So she was distracted and was trying to hurry. I was distracted because I was hanging out with my friends. It's not Diana's fault. It's I was just very fault. invested in what she was. No, it's not. I was very <laughs> invested in what she was telling me. But, but it, you know, um, Alyssa with Alyssa Threads, she had to go to the hospital and have hers removed and stitched up. And uh, she did the same thing I did where she didn't completely move her foot off the pedal. She just lifted it. Mm -hmm. And she didn't realize she had laid her foot back down onto the pedal. And that's what got her. You so a big when pedal you, too. Well, my, my fof pedal is huge i know but even but even the smaller pedals you know i don't i don't move my foot i just lift mm -hmm. it yeah. right and so it's a consciously you, move your you foot. have to like <laughs> step your foot away yeah step your foot away um okay so now that we've kind of gone through all of the stuff about safety mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um and needles <laughs> let's let's dive in real quick um to machine maintenance and care because i get questions about this all the time mm -hmm. and this is another thing that i'm very passionate about again the reason i preach this is so that you are set up for success that you have an enjoyable sewing and successful sewing experience and that you're safe and that your machine lasts a long time because it should for sure okay so i'm going to preface this with the analogy that i say all the time oh you no you take your car to get an oil change every so many miles right mm -hmm. you get new tires every so often you get new fluids and new belts every so often guess what our machines have motors too and they also need to have similar kind of maintenance so they need to be oiled from time to time they need to be serviced by a professional from time to time checking belts that wear down um you know getting gunk out of there that gets pushed in there um so that they can continue to breathe and move and operate and work properly so just because you can't see what it looks like on the inside doesn't mean that it's okay it may need some tlc we all need a good tune-up from time oh. to time my machine has little sensors on it. The newer machines do. If the sensors get a little too dusty, the machine just freaks out. <laughs> so, you know, just keeping the, just the, the dust level. Mm -hmm. Like it's not even like a bunch of buildup and stuff. It's just like a little fine layer can just, mm -hmm. the newer machines, they're getting so fancy now. So. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about rules of thumb, because I get asked this a lot. How often should I clean my machine or get my machine serviced? So let's talk about how often you should have it serviced by a professional. Okay. If you sew as often as I do on the same machine over and over, like when I had, when I was making dog bandanas and I was making thousands of them and I was sewing all the time on the same machine, mm -hmm. that machine got serviced every six months and mm -hmm. it got cleaned out every day by and me. And that was m mostly just cottons. Cottons, eh, it was flannels, it was all sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but not super but that, fluffy. No, no. Like a fleece. Um, but that was just for my bandana. So, you know, I was sewing a lot mm -hmm. and um, it doesn't even matter how, what you're sewing it with or sewing, it's, you, it's all gonna have fibers that come off and you need to clean it and you need to have it serviced. Mm -hmm. If you are running a business with your machine, you should have it serviced every six months to a year minimum. And have minimum. two machines. And have a backup. Yeah. Um, if Because you're, it's an investment in your, your business, right? Mm -hmm. um, the other flip side of that is if you are a casual sewist who doesn't sew, you know, maybe a couple times a month here or there, it's a hobby, it's, you know, um, maybe every two years or so because at the same time maybe the frequency isn't, isn't as often but you're still sewing on it you're probably not cleaning it as often um and even just sitting and collecting dust it can it can get built up or dry mm -hmm. out and need service so mm -hmm. it's still like important like when they when they on the car when they tell you to get an oil change it's either between this date range or this many miles whichever comes first mm -hmm. so it's not just about the miles. Have you gone 5,000 miles since your last oil change? It's also like, ha maybe you work from home, you don't drive as much, but it's been this much time. It still needs to be cleaned out and refreshed. So it's the same kind of concept. And that's why I use that as an analogy. Um, because even if you're not sewing as much and it's just sitting, if you've got a machine that's been gifted to you, handed down to you or bought and it's been sitting in storage for a long time, it should absolutely get serviced before you try to use it. Mm -hmm. Make sure it's in good working order. It's to keep you safe, but it's also to make sure you don't break anything um, and you know get the value out of what you just purchased or were gifted. Um, so that's kind of the rule of professional service. It's really important um, to build a relationship with your service tech. Okay? I have one. I have one. Thanks through my mom and her group of quilting guild people. And she actually travels to stores to mm. service machines. So they'll schedule her to come in and do a bunch at once, but she'll also come to your home. Nice. And so 
we um will all schedule a day for her to come to like my mom's house and my me my mom and some of her friends will all bring our machines to her house and she'll service them all in that one day Mm -hmm. um uh, if there's issues she'll take them with her to get the parts and fix and bring them back but most of the time it's just a deep clean she takes it apart and really cleans it out um and oils it and makes sure everything's working properly um and then you know we get our machine back the same day um and then it kind of helps on the cost because she has a service like a charge to just come and then Mm -hmm. she has a charge per machine and depending on the machine determines like a mechanical heavy duty or a mechanical singer machine is going to be cheaper than servicing my fof Mm -hmm. machine that's huge and has a lot more components to it so um yeah so we pay per the machine and then we split the cert the fee for her to come to the house so it just kind of helps make the most of her time and lower the cost a little bit i know it's not cheap okay i know it's not but it's an investment in your machine that you've already invested in and if you're running a business with it it's an investment in your business write it off Mm -hmm. um that's true so that it's an expense to run your business so it's it's very important all right so if you can't find somebody we need to take care of ourselves yeah so that's what we're going to talk about now and this doing these things on your own in between professional services um will help the longevity and of your machine. So even if you can't get it serviced every two to three years, um, you should be doing these things on a regular basis. So you should be cleaning out your machine. Um, let's talk about sewing machine. Sewing machine, you should clean it out. If you're sewing every week, you should clean it out every week. Mm-hmm. If you're sewing something super fluffy or really messy or a lot of fibers are coming off of it, uh, batting or any anything that frays or fuzzies, um, you should clean it out after every project. Mm-hmm. Um, that means, and you can't see it here, but that means taking the whole metal cover plate, sewing plate off, taking mm-hmm. the bobbin out, bobbin casing out, cleaning it out. We're going to stop right here. And we're going to tell you <laughs> right now. Oh, no. PSA. Do not use a can of air oh, on <laughs> your sewing machine ever (laughs) ever or else you're gonna get in trouble (laughs) let me tell you why think Um, of it this way you you see you blast that air and all this little it's so uh, bunny like yeah these little dust bunnies come flying out (laughs) but think of how many dust bunnies don't come flying out and now they're blown further blasted further into your machine that you now can't access and they're building up in that motor Mm. every time you do it yeah quick i'm done clean no wrong Mm. wrong surface level maybe but how much just went into that machine i have four cans that i can't do anything with it because bethany said i'm not allowed to use them use it on your keyboard (laughs) Mm. it's also not good for that either but anyways (laughs) you, you don't want to be pushing that stuff down into whatever it is Mm -hmm. right um so we want to gently pull it out so we're going to use a lot of machines nowadays but not always but you can get them online and i gave them to everyone that came to the Mm -hmm. sewing retreat pretty cool it's a it looks it's a little brush on one end and it looks like a little mini like kitchen brush on the other end it's like round and like like, spirals yeah and it's bristly so mm-hmm. the brush can help brush things out, but that really kind of gets in between some of those hard to reach yeah, places and it yeah. it's a little rougher. So it grips the dust bunnies and pulls them out. So you want to do that. You want to use a brush, a bristle and get them out. I use that while I have a mini vacuum mm-hmm. or a vacuum near mm-hmm. um, so that as I pull s- loose in that stuff, it's getting sucked out of the machine, not mm-hmm. blown into it. Mm-hmm. So we want to get the stuff out mm-hmm. the right way. Uh, we want to bring it out the same way it kind of got in there. Um, so you want to you want to do that um, often. You also want to make sure that you're cleaning like up around the top of where your needle goes into above up in there. Um, that whole area can get really gunky. Yeah, uh, your definitely. needles can get gunky and dusty, and that is going to fall down into that so you just yeah. want to clean that out too but also the thread could possibly just like pick it up as it's going down into mm-hmm. the yeah 
Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's important. Um, When it comes to sergers, those should be cleaned out after every project. Oh, yeah. Because they are cutting um, and there's a lot more moving parts in there. There's more threads. So the the Mm -hmm. thread dust. More threads, more fibers, more everything, um, more stitches. Uh, It's a lot. So you want to be sure that you, too, take off that cover plate, really get in there, use a vacuum, do not use a can of air. Um, I saw Um, on a video the other day where someone recommended taking fabric and running it between your tension discs. No, I, I have never seen that. And my first instinct was don't do that because that could damage your tension discs. Yeah. I would not recommend that at all. Um, personally, um, I I didn't really understand the point, but you could probably take a brush and maybe just like brush them. Exactly. But I wouldn't, I gently, I would a very soft brush. I would not shove something into that tension disc bigger than the thread that you're feeding it through it. Right. Uh, That was my first instinct. I've never seen anybody do that before. And I was like, "Uh, no, um, when you are threading your thread through your tension disc, a lot of times people just bring it down into there and just keep threading. I hold both ends of the thread above the tension disc and below. And when I feed it through there, I actually floss it back and forth to make Hmm. sure it's all the way down into that tension disc. Mm -hmm. I do that for all my tension discs, four or five, however many I'm threading. And that way I know that it's actually down into that tension disc. So I'm not going to have a tension issue with those threads. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times people are like, oh, my surgery's skipping a stitch on my left needle or right mm-hmm. needle every, every so often I'm like, your thread's not in that tension disc all the way. You mm-hmm. need to floss it down in there. Like you floss your teeth. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, but just be careful what you put down, down in those tension discs. I, I wouldn't do, I wouldn't do that personally. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm not a professional service tech, but I have worked with a lot of machines. I have troubleshot a lot of machines. I have had very in-depth conversations with our professional service techs at the office. Yeah. And I've, I've absorbed as much as I can from them. And I ask them questions all the time. And if there's something I don't know the answer to that someone asked me, I'll message them like, Hey, what do you, what, what's your recommendation here? If you know, mm-hmm. um, the other fail safe is to look at your manual. Okay. Um, If you don't have a copy of your manual, you can usually find it online. A lot of machines don't come with paper manuals anymore. I know our Singer machines, they don't just to save paper. So they're actually digital download off our website. So you just have to go search for your machine and you can download it. So you save it to your computer or your phone or whatever, and you can reference it. And then when it's a digital PDF, you can hit control F and search for keywords. So you don't have to go through the whole thing. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So if you have an issue with the needle or whatever, bobbin, you can just search bobbin yeah. and it'll pull it up. All the information, all the times bobbin's mentioned in that. So I you can do go enjoy my paper though. I, I, am. I know. Yeah. You can print it off if you want. That's true. Or just Laminate the pages it. that you need. In a binder. Yeah. Good luck with that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm more of a digital person. Um, but anyways, uh, I also recommend keeping your machines covered when you're not using them. Oh, I used to do that. And then I stopped a dust cover. Um, with especially one. if you're going to go a long period without using it. Yeah. So if you're going out of town or, you know, you're not going to be sewing for a while or whatever, keep it covered. Like my um, cover stitch. I don't use that very often. So I'll keep that one covered. Mm-hmm. Usually my regular and my serger isn't yeah that's good oh, if, um, oh that'd be fun there are so many patterns online and free patterns of some adorable machine covers mm-hmm. um with little pockets for things that's and everything custom to mine yeah my own absolutely <laughs> so make it a fun project and then if it's something fun and cute you're more likely to use it mm-hmm. um cool. but but on a on a regular basis you know, when I go to clean my house and I dust everything, I go in my sewing room and dust my machines. I wipe them down. Mm-hmm. I clean them. I mean, I, I don't know. I just, they're an investment. I take such pride and joy in them. that I want them to always look their best, work their best, present as their best selves. Like, 
I, if it looks nice and is in good shape and condition and well taken care of, I'm going to want to sit in front of it. And so on a regular basis, just makes mm-hmm. it more fun. Um, so project, I, my role is, you know, I kind of clean, lightly clean things after every project, especially on sergers. I do deep cleans once a week. Mm-hmm. Um, and once a month I'll go in and really deep clean and add a few drops of oil. So the other rule is oil. Mm -hmm. This is one of those things where you need to reference the manual. Every machine's a little different, but if it's a, especially on sergers where there's cylinders that go in and out of each other in a moving way, like a piston. Yeah, uh, exactly. Those are the things that you just, and when I say a drop, Mm -hmm. just the tiniest drop, hand will it in, Okay, move it up and down, really get it in. If you have any excess that's dripping or anything, you got a little too much, get it paper towel or a tissue or some napkin or something and soak it up. Mm -hmm. You don't want that to get onto our thread and onto our fabric. So just take the time to do that. Once Mm -hmm. a month, once, if you don't sew very often, maybe once every few months, but just know that it's part of keeping it well oiled and it's going to help it not, burn up and get too hot and friction and all those kind of things and jamming uh it's going to just make it a much smoother sewing experience so um and then if you are going to be storing your machine or you have a machine that you're kind of setting aside as like a backup machine that you're not going to be using because you got a new one or whatever don't store it in your attic don't store it in your garage Put it in a closet inside the house where it's temperature controlled. Okay. Mm-hmm. Don't put it in a storage unit that's not temperature controlled. Put it in a closet inside your home. Um, it's just not safe for it. It's not good for it. It can cause discoloration with the heat of the plastics. I've seen white machines turn yellow because they were stored in heat. Yeah. Um, or the sun or something will just. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So just keep that in mind. And then I'm glad you mentioned the sun because if your machine is sitting in front of a window that gets a lot of sun, This is why you want to put a cover over it. It can also Mm -hmm. cause discoloration. So just fun, fun things to think about profession, like to be able to keep it. I really want to go and clean now. (laughs) I've got, I've got the the itch to clean. (laughs) Good, good. I hope everybody's gotten the itch to clean their machines. It's to me, I like to do it like on a Sunday morning or a Saturday morning before I sit down in my sewing room. And that's when I typically will do it. I have my coffee. Yeah. And I turn on some tunes or listen to an audio book and I just, it doesn't take me long because yeah. I do it on a regular basis. So it doesn't take me long and it just builds a good habit. And then I'm like, okay, it's all clean and happy. Let's sew something, mm-hmm. you know? So. Oh, yeah. another thing is to make sure you brush out your feed dogs because you don't realize how mm-hmm. much lint gets stuck in those feed dogs. Oh my God. Yep. I was sewing the fleece and it got so compacted that you couldn't tell. That yep. there was lint in it. It feels it like that it's gap. part of the feed dog. Take those tweezers. Tweezers yep. are very helpful in cleaning as well. Besides the little brush and the bristles and the little mini vacuum, which I yeah. will drop. We'll put links to those things that I use in the description so you guys have them. But um, if you want to grab some, but the uh, the tweezers can come in very handy for getting in there. It's almost like you're playing mm-hmm. the game operation and you're pulling out the dust bunnies one at a time. It's very satisfying. My OCD <laughs> loves it. <laughs> yeah. right, so we've, we've shared a lot today mm-hmm. and I hope you guys are thinking now machine safety, sewing room safety, and machine care. I hope this gave you some advice on a little bit of troubleshooting if you have it. Um, you know, just all these all these things. It's, 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 a, it's a machine with a motor. So we just have to remember that, you know, it, it can be temperamental at times. It may need, need a little love. It's like a small child or a pet that can't tell us what's wrong. We have to be have the knowledge of how these work to be able to figure it out and have the right tools and resources. And again, we're not going to use a can of air on our sewing machines. Mm-hmm. Okay, thanks. Okay. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Seriously, I, I feel like I've been preaching it today. This is my sermon. Um, <laughs> but, you know, 
again, I know I've said this several times. I just want you to have the best sewing experience. I hope you know that it, it comes from a place deep down in my heart because I care about your sewing experience. If we don't have an enjoyable sewing experience, we're going to quit, give up and yeah. not keep doing it. And I don't want you to get to that point. Yeah, I for don't. sure. If you feel like you're getting to that point, message me. We'll talk about it. Yeah. I'm not going to condemn you. I'm not going to judge you. If you've never cleaned your machine or oiled it, I don't, I don't care. We, I you don't can't undo the past. You can only yeah. make better habits moving forward. I don't think and that that's what we're going to do. I don't think that was a thing that like no one ever told me when I was no. not until I was probably last year thirties when you that, met me. <laughs> like I'm just kidding. My mom, I never saw my mom clean her machine. I don't, that was never something that she said. I remember having like these brushes. Maybe she cleaned it when I wasn't around, but it just wasn't something that she told me that that was like something I needed to do. So for a long time, I didn't. <laughs> no. The more you know. Exactly. Right? Yeah. The more you know. You, I don't blame you for not knowing, but if you've listened to this podcast, <laughs> now you know, and you have no excuse. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, I just, again, just want you to and love you your machine. And if you have a really bad machine, send us a before and after. We would love to see it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Those are the most satisfying photos. <laughs> Seriously, if you open up your machine and you're like, okay, that's a mess. I yeah. want to see it. Yeah. And then I want to see the after of you cleaning it. And we'll celebrate okay? you. We're not we going to will... shame you. No. Gosh, no. It's going to encourage more people to do it. Yeah, Honestly, exactly. we've just talked about it and Ashley's ready to go clean her machine. And I kind of want to, too. Yeah. You want to go clean our machines? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we're going to go clean our sewing machines and have fun. It's fun to do it with a friend, too. Um, and I hope you guys take some time this week to clean your machines uh, and change your needle. All right. So since Ashley and I are going to go clean our machines now, we're going to sign off. But before we do, I just want to remind you that you can hop over to our YouTube channel and subscribe. We are so close to a thousand subscribers. It would help us so much in growing that channel. Even if you don't watch the episode, you like to listen to it, just hop on over there and hit subscribe. We do share some other stuff over there too. So you might want to see that. Um, also, we have our newsletter, which you guys know about. We talk about often our weekly newsletter. It gives you insights on what's going on. But we do also now have a social shop, the mm -hmm. social hour shop. And that's where you can grab things like the accurate body measurement guide for sewing garments that we just released um, last week. And so you want to be able to go over and grab that off our website. It's a digital PDF download. Um, so definitely take advantage of that. And you're going to see more of those resources come up. So be sure you check out that. The last thing I want to mention, though, is we have some podcast episodes coming up in October that we're really excited about, about fall and Halloween. And we posted this over on our Instagram. So if you're not following us on Instagram, you need to go follow us because we we put a lot of stuff in our stories to check in with our and engage with our listeners. <laughs> but we love it when our listeners submit photos or uh, anything about That's any right. of the podcasts that we've done, you know, sharing their sewing space or their summer projects or all those kind of things. Mm -hmm. So our, we have two podcasts that we're going to do in October. One is about sewing fall and Halloween decor, mm -hmm. decorations, home decor, all of that. The other one's going to be about sewing Halloween costumes for you, for your kids, for your friends. We want to see them. We have a new submission process for this just to help us be able to keep up with all the submissions because we do get quite a bit and we don't want to leave anybody out. So if you go to our website, there's a place where you can submit those, get tell us who you are and the, submit the photos and a little bit about the photos so we know what we're looking at and what, we, what you want us to share about it. Um, so we want to get as much input as we can for those episodes. So if you have any of that, please hop over to our website. We'll link it in the description below so you can go submit those photos. Until mm -hmm. next time, though, happy sewing and happy cleaning, guys. Go clean your machines. All right. Bye. Bye.